We are a tag team, and uh, perhaps uh, we need to be, uh, because this is a controversial subject. And I come to you as an academic, and I realize that that term has been used somewhat pejoratively a few times today. So rather than talk about theory, I want to talk about common sense and start out with uh, what we know. And what do we know? Well, we know that a prudent and sensible banker does not loan someone $970,000 to buy a million dollar house. I think we can all agree on that. We also know that if that person who's buying the house says, but Mr. Banker, you must allow me to put down only 30,000 since that is the only way I can get the ROE, rate of return on equity, that I need on my investment, we know that the banker is going to say no. What else do we know? I think it was pretty well rehearsed today. We know that in 2007, we had a very highly leveraged, very fragile financial sector. It was basically 30,000 down on a million dollar house. Now, of course, we were told, and we actually assumed perhaps, that the situation was not the same as a highly leveraged house because banks and others had accurate risk models and effective ways to control risk. But we also know what happened. So let me ask the question, would the situation have been less dire had the financial sector been much less leveraged? And I assert to you that that is basically a rhetorical question. It's not our position that high equity uh, low leverage solves everything, but I think we can all agree that the situation would have played out very differently. And in fact, this was what was alluded to before, we can look back in history and we can see times when the bank sector was much less highly leveraged, much more equity, and things still seem to function, which leads to the question, why don't we have more equity? And we've talked in various ways today about some of the advantages of having much greater equity, bigger down payments, you might say. Systemic risk is certainly reduced. There's less chance of a financial crisis. And uh, the deadweight losses, and we never should forget the deadweight losses that are associated with the financial crisis, which David Miles uh, quantified in various ways here. Risk is privatized. We talked about the importance of having the market basically governing how things are done rather than leaving it to regulators. Well, to the extent that insurance is being provided here, it's by equity, not by the government. And so we can say that this is moving in the direction that Kevin Walsh and others were saying of having the market do it rather than the government. And the incentives to take socially unproductive risks are clearly reduced at the margin if we increase equity. So the social benefits are quite large, which of course leads to the question, why is there a controversy here? Uh, why are we up here? Because if uh, equity has so much to offer in terms of these social benefits, why don't we see more people calling for it? Why is there such resistance? And of course the resistance is that it's expensive. Is it really expensive? That's the question we want to ask. And it's very, very, very important, I put three varies in there, to distinguish between private and social. And we've sort of talked around the margins on this, but let's be very clear. What are the private costs to have more equity? Well, the tax code basically disfavors equity, favors debt financing. There's no doubt about that. The government makes debt cheap through implicit guarantees, the too big to fail subsidies, perhaps underpriced deposit insurance, uh, various things of that sort. That favors debt over equity. And increasing equity, as we'll see a little bit later, when Peter talks mechanically, reduces ROE and uh, also reduces risk. But if compensation is somehow tied somewhat rigidly to ROE, this potentially can reduce someone's pay which gets certain people's attention. What are the social costs? That's the real question here, and that's a big question mark. Let's talk about a little bit more about these incentives. There's a too big to fail subsidy that we've talked about, and if a bank believes 
uh, if the investors in a bank, specifically the creditors, believe that there's some potential for the government to come in and give support, that's going to lower the required yield on that debt. And you can do a very simple calculation to show that this is a non-trivial effect. For instance, if we just reduce the average cost of liabilities by 2.5 basis points with only 3% equity, that's a 1% increase in ROE. If we increase or decrease that cost by 10 basis points, again, that's not all that much, we get a 3% increase in ROE. So this definitely creates some incentives. Now, is this hypothetical? Is this academic theory? No. Even Moody's, as we talked earlier, uh, recognizes this and, in fact, gives two different ratings, one based upon government support and one as a standalone. So let's talk about the incentives in banking very quickly. I'm going to simplify banking a little bit here, but not much. It's a spread business. You receive interest and then you pay interest. But bankers, if they get this subsidy, aren't really paying all the interest that they should. Some of that subsidy is basically uh, given by the government that comes in the form of less interest paid. And that's a minus to all of us in the room that aren't bankers. And then, of course, we pay taxes, uh, all of us, including the banks. But that's a benefit to the government. Uh, there is a question as to what's done with it. Now, we divide this by equity. We get required rate of return on equity, or the return on equity here. And now, let's look at what the incentives are. If I take that equity and make it smaller, what happens? Well, the first thing is I will pay a little bit more interest, but that's increasing the subsidy. And I'll pay less taxes. So the bank is going to have a higher numerator here. The government has clearly lost. It's minus the subsidies plus the taxes. Both of those have gone down. And now we're dividing by a smaller number there in the, num in the denominator. That's going to make for a higher ROE. So the incentives are very clear. But let me also be very clear. Just because bankers have an incentive to argue for economizing on equity, for the very clear reasons that we just saw, it doesn't mean that they're wrong when they say that equity might be expensive, but it does mean very strongly that we should be skeptical and we should demand that they support their claims with sound arguments. Now, one thing that might be asserted is, yes, there are these subsidies, but these subsidies are important because they do beneficial things, and they pass on some of these subsidies to those who are borrowing. But let's think about that just a little bit more. If we are basically giving tax and implicit government subsidies that are creating incentive for leverage and high leverage, that's bad, because that creates the systemic risks that we're all trying to avoid. And the question really is, at the end of the day, does that really lead to better loans? And if it does, let's do it directly, not through a mechanism that creates problems. So the big question here, which uh, we're going to look at in a little bit more detail here, is are there social costs to bank equity? Now, we started out looking at private costs, but no, that's not what we should look at. We should look at the social costs and be mindful of the social benefits that are very large. And now there's a question as to what these social costs are. So what we're going to now do is turn to a very skeptical appraisal of the arguments that have been put forward for saying that that question mark there is positive and large. I've made it small, but I don't want to prejudge things. Here's Peter. Thanks, Paul. Um, and uh, whoops, let me go forward here instead of backwards. Um, so obviously, uh, we're thinking about uh, today the, the trade-off between capital requirements, um, which we have many have argued today uh, will reduce uh, the probability of a financial crisis. On the other hand, um, there's the issue of higher borrowing costs, potential higher borrowing costs, and if that will slow economic growth. And so the real question is, uh, how do we trade those off? Uh, we've seen some analyses today, uh, heard some discussion about it. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, in our discussion is uh, refine that debate and, and get us to focus on what, what the key issues are. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot today about the increase in leverage that led to the financial crisis. Um, and we think about sort of these deleveraging spirals that uh, result from leverage. Uh, 
um, if we have uh, a 3% equity, a 1% decline in asset value means a 30% uh, reduction, uh, contraction balance, potential balance sheet contraction if we try to recapitalize uh, without raising new funds. And so we get the problem of asset fire sales, illiquidity market failure, uncertainty bailouts, all the things that we observed uh, in the crisis. And so the question is, um, can we address that with more capital? Um, is, is that a tool that regulators should feel uh, confident um, utilizing in this context? And uh, we're going back to uh, David Vineyard's uh, point this morning where he argued that liquidity is costly to maintain, um, but even more costly uh, if, if not maintained. I would say the same is true uh, uh, for capital in terms of the benefit of maintaining capital is quite high. Um, uh, and probably even higher, given that capital adequacy and solvency is a precursor uh, to liquidity. Um, and yet, I'll argue that the costs uh, are actually lower uh, for maintaining adequate capital uh, than for liquidity per se, where we know there is some cost uh, to maintaining uh, liquidity. Uh, for capital, I argue, is, is very different. And that's an important point that we think uh, we'd like regulators to understand um, in terms of being more flexible in their use of capital as a mechanism to uh, increase safety in the banking sector. Um, so, so the question is equity too expensive and what I want to talk about in my, in my section is sort of what are some of the arguments that have been used that you hear about why equity is expensive, why we don't think those are the right arguments and why our um, uh, kind of question to uh, practitioners who are concerned about these requirements is you know, what, let's get, let's dig deeper into what might be the real cost because the ones that are put forth don't seem like the correct, the correct ones. So first, uh, confusion, sort of a crowding out uh, concern. The idea that uh, uh, increased capital requirements will force banks to reduce lending um, simply because it means they have to set aside uh, some assets. And of course, that's not what uh, capital requirements uh, are about. It's not about setting aside any assets. It's a funding issue um, and it's about leverage. So it's really a question of capital structure. So the idea that holding capital is expensive is sort of a misnomer since we're not holding anything per se. It's not, it's not a question about how we allocate assets. Um, in terms of uh, increasing capital, uh, there are different ways we can do that. Um, but importantly, there's no mechanical requirement that we uh, reduce uh, lending uh, through increase, increased capital requirements. Of course, that's one way it can happen. If I want to double the amount of capital the bank has, one way to do it is to contract uh, the assets and move from 10% capital to 20% capital in that way. Um, but an alternative way to do that is uh, we could simply recapitalize some of the um, uh, liabilities uh, through an increase in equity. Um, and we might argue, well, we don't necessarily want to do that because um, some of these liabilities like deposits are, are important as part of the value creation of the banking system uh, and, the, and the services it provides. Uh, well, there's still a third way we can do it, which is an asset expansion, right? We could simply raise new equity, put new assets on the balance sheet, um, a third way to do that. And so just there's no mechanical reason, um, which sometimes argued, that an increase in equity requirements are going to uh, lead to a reduction in lending. Now, of course, we'd say, well, it's about the cost of these three different alternatives. And there is some reason to think that banks might be pushed towards um, the former versus the latter in terms of uh, raising new equity um, will benefit creditors and uh, will help creditors uh, and, and therefore be costly to equity holders. And so one of the things from a regulatory standpoint to think about is, you know, are there ways we can provide mechanisms that push banks in this direction uh, versus this direction? Of course, helping creditors uh, uh, is a way of uh, attempting to get banks to pay for uh, the costs of uh, the risks they're taking as opposed to leaving it uh, for, the gov for government uh, bailouts and other subsidies from, from that form. So, um, so that's one thing to think about, and one of the proposals along these lines is to suggest that um, we, we uh, get banks to increase capital by looking at uh, lagged uh, asset base as opposed to um, allowing them to do it by uh, asset contraction. It's certainly something to think about. But the key point is there's no mechanical need uh, for an increase in capital to lead to uh, 
a reduction in lending. Uh, the second point is uh, lower ROE, uh, which we heard uh, discussed this morning. That is uh, a concern that you'll hear from the banks that it's going to lower the returns to equity holders. Um, um, and you know, that statement is partially true. Uh, but the point is that low RE does not reduce uh, firm value, doesn't necessarily reduce uh, firm value. Um, and that lower expected RE is appropriate given the reduced risk with higher capital requirements. And in particular, if we just look at what happens to RE comparing a 10% capital with 20% capital, um, it's true that ROE is lower in good times uh, with higher capital, but it's higher in bad times, right? That capital is providing that buffer in bad times. And so, what we're sort of giving up, in a sense, up here for shareholders, we're gaining uh, down here. Um, and that if things are fairly priced and ignoring other imperfections in the market, these two should be equivalent in value terms uh, from a shareholder perspective. And so it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't uh, reduce uh, shareholder value uh, per se. Now, of course, if the downside here is already being, if, if equity holders are not, uh, don't need to worry about that downside because of other protections through government guarantees, then they are giving up subsidies again in this trade-off, and that would be an example of a private incentive uh, not to want to increase capital that we spoke of earlier. Um, performance evaluation, another issue, obviously, you know, we think about ROE, and I want to give a, another example of why ROE isn't really a very good measure to think about. Um, uh, the value created uh, by the banks. Um, we think of a manager, uh, a fund manager with a 22% return or one with a 20% return, and who deserves higher compensation? Well, obviously, that's not enough information, um, especially if I told you that the first one uh, was taking a much riskier strategy and uh, had m much fewer assets under management. Um, the point is that when we think about returns, we really need to think about risk-adjusted value added. So the alpha generated times the assets under management, or kind of translating the banking context, we'd want to think about excess ROE above what's a fair risk-adjusted return, uh, given the risk they're taking, times the amount of equity base that that's on. And that measure is going to be invariant to leverage, again, absent other frictions and so forth. So uh, looking at ROE per se isn't really the right measure if we want to think about value added. Um, the third point on equities expensive is simply that uh, you know well, equity is just equity capital is much more costly. So if we've got to increase the amount of equity capital, that's going to uh, raise uh, the costs of doing business, and that's going to be uh, trans uh, transferred uh, to borrowers. We heard this morning that the cost of equity is a step function, or uh, or might not move uh, as we as we increase capital. Um, and really, these arguments ignore the fact that we know the cost of equity will decline with higher capital, reduced risk, offsetting its higher costs. Uh, there's a fair amount of evidence uh, for that, empirical evidence. It's also the basis of most models that the banks themselves use when thinking about a variety of, uh, of products that they go ahead and market. So, so that's got to be the case. And so we really have to be arguing something about equity investors being irrational or there being some other supply constraints or other factors in the market. Um, so I want to kind of just do a simple thought experiment here. Um, you know, we've got assets and liabilities. Um, we think of the asset side as sort of value creation. Uh, unlike most uh, f uh, standard industrial firms, though, value creation also happens on the, on the liability side for banks in terms of deposits, deposit taking and transaction services and so forth. Uh, so we want to think of some of this as part of the underlying business of the bank. But there's a fair amount that's just of the funding piece. And we want to think about what happens if we, uh, if we separate some of that and we take some of that funding in and replace it rather than so being high, so highly leveraged and put equity in its place. And the point, of course, is that in a rational uh, market, the cost of this larger equity piece should be the blended cost of the debt and equity that we had before. Um, this would be, uh, again, just a standard argument with you making any sort of portfolio analysis. Um, and therefore, that it shouldn't raise the weighted average cost of capital for equity uh, for the bank. Um, uh, that shareholders should understand this. If they don't, then something is, must be fundamentally wrong in the market. Again, either there's some irrationality or supply constraints or other factors. Now, if you like, one thing you could think about is, well, suppose we did that, and suppose we were concerned that this uh, 
cost of equity reduction would not occur, one could think about separating the leverage kind of from the bank entity itself. So we could imagine taking this equity, uh, uh, pooling it, and then uh, creating products uh, that replicate these payoffs that could be sold to investors, but separate from uh, the bank uh, activity itself. So even if there are ultimately losses on some of these product equity link deck type products, um, they don't put the bank in any sort of distress. So we could imagine separating those. And the real question is, what is the cost uh, from doing this? In fact, this might be even more flexible in terms of if investors prefer more leverage or less leverage, we could get uh, the optimal mix determined separately from the bank's activity itself. Okay. So that's, uh, let me leave it there and turn it over to Anat. I think the key questions are, um, we've talked about taxes and government guarantees as, as private benefits to the banking sector, but not, not social benefits. Um, we talked about some of the key arguments that you hear for why equity is costly and said that uh, they don't really hold up. So the key question, I think, for practitioners um, and for researchers, think about, well, if there are costs, what are they? Uh, and let's get down and, and define them precisely so we can measure them and so we can make sure whatever policy prescriptions we have are directed towards what those true costs are. Thank you. So I'll just go until you physically remove me from here. Um, okay, I get the logo again. So the key question that we have here, is high leverage somehow a function, uh, something inherent in banking? This comes with the territory of banking and got to be there because that's the way it is. It's a debt business, it's a spread business, it's a leverage business. Our answer to this question is that we've looked at all of the arguments that were made and actually some that are not yet in our paper that are also made. And so far in about a year or more looking at it, we actually have not found anything that would convince us uh, that high leverage is necessary for banks to function. Um, it is true that uh, some debt of uh, the bank, as was mentioned, is part of their business, but that is not the same. The amount of debt is not the same as the amount of leverage. So um, it entails a large social cost, and we do not see any benefit from the high leverage socially. Everything about the value that banks create can be done with less leverage. There is absolutely nothing we can see in the economics of it that would tell you that 25% equity on total balance sheet should be unthinkable for banks. If somebody thinks that that is a terrible, horrible thing, we haven't, explained, we haven't seen why yet. Um, in particular, this balance sheet C, if you were to think about it, and I do not mean to suggest that banks should grow even larger, this is just a way to think about this because I think once they have more equity funding, we will see the natural size of the banking sector and of individual banks more organically is whether adding equity is somehow expensive and in what sense is it expensive. In fact, I would argue, uh, we argue, that it's not only not expensive, it's a social bargain. Only good things happen when you do that. For what, anyway? In other words, as far as the eye can see from where we are right now, all we can see is benefits to increasing equity. We do not see costs, certainly not high costs. So we didn't say that equity is not costly. We said well, it's not expensive. Expensive is in Tiffany's, you know, expensive. Uh, so uh, you could say that uh, we need the safety net expansion. And I think we already agreed in this forum that that is not a good thing. The safety net was created to prevent inefficient bank runs uh, in FDIC. Before that, by the way, uh, banks had uh, in the U.S., not even limited liability. So banks in the U.S. until uh, the 1930s, 40s, in many states, uh, had double, triple, and unlimited liability. And the liabilities of the downside of the notes at the time was borne by equity, except that in the Depression, there was a lot of personal bankruptcy, and it was decided there was a lot of inefficient runs. And when banks were very small and not diversified, there were runs, even though there was a lot of equity. So it's not like there were runs for different reasons. And so we've got a better system, and the system has become more leveraged, as we saw. Uh, but the safety net has expanded, as the Bank of Richmond has shown. And the question is whether, uh, whether we have sort of too much of it. So uh, to expand it, uh, w w without giving a free gift to the banks, 
is to charge for it, which would mean some kind of a bailout fund, but that's very, very difficult to price, and already FDIC is hard enough to price. So uh, it's not, if we can avoid it, that's not the way to just insure everything. Uh, it would be very hard, and uh, the moral hazard is always there, because there'll always be a step ahead of trying to take advantage of those guarantees. So we uh, do not recommend that, if it's possible, to uh, create a little more self-insurance, and self-insurance is precisely equity. Equity means that the private sector bears a lot more of the downside, and so it's a question of whether the uh, economy as a whole can stand that, can stand to have 20% of risk capital in the economy uh, uh, back up the bank's liability instead of uh, some other uh, system. We had a presentation about loss-absorbing debt, and this is uh, sometimes people think of, uh, of contingent capital and bail-inable debt as a substitute for equity. We believe that it's a poor substitute. In the uh, crisis, no hybrids uh, suffered any losses. Uh, the idea here is to conserve on equity. And since we do not believe equity is expensive, we do not see a reason to uh, conserve on equity and create magical, uh, complicated ways to get the debt to become equity, because then we have to ask what, why it was debt in the first place which is like long-term debt or others, why was it issued as debt to begin with? What was it doing as a debt? Because it's not the secured debt, it's not the deposits uh, that are going to be inflicted at the debt, it's unsecured, subordinated debt. Why is it there instead of being equity? So we're going to ask that question. Uh, Bailing uh, is, uh, of course, a sort of can be thought of as part of a resolution and as a way to sort of, pre uh, sort of preempt the bankruptcy, the laws of bankruptcy, what happens when you default. And obviously, we want a better system than, than bankruptcy laws, so I completely agree with that. And uh, in that context, obviously, we should, we should be thinking about whatever we can do across countries and all these things. Uh, but it is not a substitute for pushing equity requirements way higher, and we would even say way higher than David Miles recommends. Uh, and so, uh, why bankers agree for, to COCOs? Well, Barclays told us that they want COCOs so that the ROE will not be affected. That is not a valid reason. Uh, taking advantage of taxes, uh, tax uh, subsidies to the extent it is tax deductible is also not a social cost, as we explained. So what we uh, feel is that if you compare, uh, if whatever you were going to make contingent capital at the time that you issue it as contingent capital, uh, you instead make it equity. Then, when the assets go down, uh, obviously we don't want bailouts, so none of, the, no, none of us kind of want that. Uh, if contingent capital was going to bring you the equity that you need, if it was issued as equity, you would also have it there. So it's not about recapitalization, it's about capitalization. So whatever contingent capital was going to do for you, equity can do for you. And somebody's going to have to explain why contingent capital then is not better than debt, but why it's better than equity. There are other things that are said, some of them by academics. They're not logical fallacies or uh, the confusions between private and social costs and benefits. Uh, but we have theories that say that debt contracts are, uh, have discipline. Well, discipline, as we already heard, does not work uh, when there's uh, bailouts. So anything that's guaranteed is not going to do any discipline for you. We uh, can agree on that. The threat to run is not going to discipline when it's not a credible threat. The threat to default uh, it doesn't do anything if, uh, if there's a bailout or, uh, or if you can recapitalize immediately. So uh, it, it, there needs to be a real threat there, and it's not there. And the question also is, even if you were to say that debt can discipline, and debt does discipline in many models, which explains why the bank itself does not take equity position in the small businesses that it runs. So the debt is an optimal contract for, you know, pay me, and then I won't have to worry about it until you don't pay me, and then I will worry about it at a cost. Okay, so that's kind of optimal contracting for small people, uh, borrowers, but not for the bank uh, necessarily. Even if it was providing some discipline, the question is, it, do we need it at the cost, at the social cost that it in, involves? Can we do governance? And how do other companies in the economy do their governance when they have 80, 90, 100% equity? How do they actually discipline their managers? Do they need high leverage? And if they don't, and if they choose not to, then how do they do it? And can banks also do it? Can they get a better contract with their managers? Can they give their managers preferred? Can they do anything that would not create 
this cost on the economy. So um, then people talk about issuance costs. Uh, here, there are two parts to it. One is the sort of what in a, we have a buzzword for, it's called Myers and Maslow, it's an issuance cost, about the stigma associated with, uh, with uh, uh, issuing equity or withholding dividends. And um, yes, but uh, uh, that is not a reason to not move from the level of capital that we have now to another level. That is more of a transition thing, but once you're there, any friction of this sort you have is actually lower. So whatever, whatever you talk about being at 5% versus being at 20% equity, uh, is better, even on that front, uh, because you have less need to, to, to raise equity, so you're not in the market as much, because you have retained earnings to, to uh, keep you. And this stigma also is not a social cost and can be helped by removing discussion, which was already mentioned here, uh, so that there is no stigma. Just like TARP was given to banks in a, sitting in a room and not allowed to, 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 uh, uh, to spook anybody by, by taking or not taking the money. The big picture, if you want to look at the big picture, is it's sort of the big picture of balance sheet C. And the big picture says when people ask, where is all this equity going to come from? Well, equity comes from end investors in the end for the entire economy. So if you look at the big picture here, um, then what we have in one case of highly leveraged banks is we have three kinds of assets. Some assets are held directly. That's class B. Uh, oh, what did I do here? Uh, what am I supposed to press to get this? Uh, it's been, uh, the, the, oh, this. Anyway, in, I'm still not getting it. Oh, this one. Uh -huh. uh, so in here, we have a highly leveraged bank or banking system, and some of the assets in the economy are held through that. Some are held directly, some are held through other intermediaries. Now if I move to my balance sheet C, so I didn't touch whatever the bank is doing. I didn't touch all the loans that are wonderful, and I didn't touch uh, all the deposits that everybody needs for liquidity uh, or in, in other things that are there. I didn't touch, I just did my balance sheet C just for the sake of showing you that I don't need to touch anything in the economy. I'm only regrouping claims in the economy. So in this balance sheet, right, in this picture right here, A, B, and C are still there, and I don't even mind if the banks have more assets in the economy. Let them buy more stuff and back up their liabilities. It aligns incentives better when that happens. So even if you were to tell me, theoretically, and I don't believe that they will grow this way, but I would even say I don't care if they grow as long as it's with equity, then uh, nothing really productive changed in the economy. And uh, the, uh, the end investors still hold everything that they held before. It is the case, though, that if the, if the government was going to bail out uh, the, the, these banks, then it's not ba bailing as much out these banks over here. But we think there's capacity to move to that area. OK, uh, so basically, more equity has, more, has benefits because uh, highly leveraged firms in general, but especially highly leveraged firms that have implicit guarantees, uh, have incentives to take excessive risks. This is a problem that basically makes firms stay away from, uh, from high leverage because that will recognize that they will end up taking excessive risk and will require a return for that or will require a lot of coven covenants to protect from that. So that in normal companies is going to become uh, a, little honor, uh, a, a little onerous on the, on the firm, which is why many firms don't want to lever. But the bank debt holders do not impose such covenants and other things. The big other issue hanging here is that overhang. And this is the reason, actually, that banks are really reluctant or are unable to raise funds or unwilling to raise funds for new loans when they're already highly leveraged. So when you have a lot of that already in place, uh, you are impaired in functioning. Uh, and that is a reason that we had a credit freeze. The reason for credit reduction is not too much equity, is too much Debt. And I will talk some more about lending if I have the time. Uh, we have level playing field. I have an op-ed with uh, one of my co-authors about this. Um, so uh, one has to think about who's backing up. As long as there are no subsidies, uh, it's good to have competition. Uh, the unregulated shadows is basically uh, not an argument uh, for anything because we had shadow banking with the low capital requirements. So if we want to throw our hands 
in the air and say we can't enforce anything, then we might as well not tax because of tax loopholes. In other words, that's just a defeatist argument. Can you or can't you regulate is the question. To that, that there will be enforcement issues is clear with any regulation, and there were the enforcement issues before. So it's not like this problem is, is, is going to be new or necessarily worse, because it's always going to be there. It's the same problem with low and high capital requirements. You need to figure out how to do it. Uh, and so, uh, so the shadow, it's, it's kind of not, it's an enforcement issue, and it is a challenge to, to enforce these regulations. Uh, but we just have to figure out what we want to do, and then we have to try to challenge it. Will there be, might there be a, a lending re contraction? If you really think about this question, there's, first of all, the possibility, just the possibility, that it actually is not true. These big loans, these great loans are going to lie there and not being taken. Well, in New York these days, it was, it's micro lenders that lend, because banks kind of don't feel like it's too much work to check credit worthiness, it seems. Uh, but uh, in the option expensing debate, we heard that the economy will shrink, and that didn't happen when options became expense. So just because people say something doesn't necessarily make it true. But if uh, you think about whether credit will go down, well, maybe some credit should go down. We think we had a credit bubble, and we think there was too much lending. So not all lending is good lending. We want good lending, not just any lending. Okay? So if some lending doesn't happen, that might be just as well. We don't know what the uh, true economic cost should be. The risk weights give distorted incentives. This is, uh, was discussed at lunchtime, and one of my co-authors is very strong, uh, strongly disillusioned with risk weights. So Rafael uh, presented the view that risk weights uh, could, could be distortive, and one of the immediate uh, ways to satisfy capital requirements based on risk weighted assets is to move to a low risk weighted asset. I would only point out about risk weights that uh, Greek uh, sovereign debt has zero risk weight and pays 20% right now. Uh, and that sort of rests the case. And AAA securities also had zero risk weights and turned out to be quite systemic. So risk weights uh, do not give you a measure, and we already had that covered. Uh, the debt overhang itself, where we are right now, would make you not lend. And so that by itself is, a, is, is all because we're already in a bad place and not because of where we want to go. Where we want to go is to be in a place where there won't be as much of that. Uh, if lending spreads should increase, maybe because of the subsidies that are removed and uh, there will be some, uh, uh, a little bit of a margin there, uh, but we don't, it depends what we want to subsidize. Do we want to subsidize lending or do we want to subsidize, subsidize the leverage of the banks so they can pass it on somehow? It's a very inefficient way. So the summary is that we do not have numbers, okay? People press us on the numbers uh, because we don't have, begin to have an economic theory of the cost where we are right now. So uh, David presented some costs. We can argue even with David on exactly what those costs are. But uh, I, uh, we look at the, at the REITs, and they have 30%. Uh, we just don't see where the costs come in. I don't see the big, as David pointed out, Miles, there is, uh, it's not clear it's that sensitive once you get to. Uh, so. I, it's not going to be a decimal point because I cannot even quantify some of these other benefits that I see. Uh, and the costs I can barely find, so it's going to be very hard to make them kind of on the same scale from where we are right now, or even from Basel. Uh, requirements should not be one number. I want to mention that because the, you know, the, the best line on this is the, the Charles uh, Goodhart line on the taxi cab in the station. So if you have regulation that says that there should be a taxi cab waiting at the train station, uh, at all times, then uh, when you get to the train station at 2 in the morning, the taxi cab cannot take you because then there won't be a taxi cab in the train station. So the capital requirements cannot be one number, and we see what that happens when people just, just deleverage to a number. We, you need to draw down on it. You must have a range. So the, the buffer in Basel, in principle, is a big breakthrough and is a good thing. There has to be a range, but the range and within their range, what Basel does is it restricts dividend, which is exactly the kind of, uh, 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 sort of graduated responses that you want to have. It's sort of to kind of stop capital from leaking out, which we unfortunately allowed it to happen through the crisis, and, uh, and, and maintain the leverage that regulators have, which is the equity issuance and equity payouts. Uh, in particular, to transition, all you need to say, and then you can't even tell me about issuance costs, is retain earnings. Now, in other words, allowing banks to pay dividends was extremely offensive to some of us. Uh, that's it. Uh, you can see the paper and some other writings uh, in this uh, website, and we had copies of some things uh, out there. And I guess 
we will answer questions. Uh, I'm the last, so, but um, uh, any one of us will answer questions if there are any. There is not much time. But. Could you elaborate on the point of not of having a ratio that's completely risk insensitive? Because I see a problem both ways. Basel I was risk insensitive and it led to regulatory arbitrage because if a bank was told it has to hold the same capital for a loan to a AAA firm as to a non-investment grade firm, it led to all sorts of consequences. But if you but the converse is if you do have risk sensitivity, your argument would seem to imply it doesn't matter if risk measures are wrong because banks should be indifferent to how much capital they hold. And that seems very no. paradoxical. No, 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 not banks, but society. Society, banks will, will not like it. So, but I'm talking about regulators. Uh, the vision that we have, the, uh, the vision that we describe is certainly you're completely right. I mean, capital does not mean anything except for the riskiness. If you have a tre uh, all treasuries in your, in your assets, then my capital requirements are not, they, they don't need to be high. So clearly, it has to be a function of the, uh, the, the, the image that we have on capital requirements is that of a marginal requirement in exchange. We have in mind these smart regulators instead of what, uh, what Erwin wants them to do, which is to know when that point is when a complicated bank is in, insolvent and just be there overnight to transform its balance sheet or when 15 banks are doing that. We want the regulators in healthy times to, to monitor just like an exchange does for marginal calls and to hold their hands on levers to monitor the systemic risk more than even the individual risk, because maybe some firm should be allowed to pay, and then and adjust the capital requirements to the risk. So when, when I say 30%, I mean like, for example, relative to current assets. I don't know. We have to work on that. So I don't know. But are you right? Any other answers? <laughs> Why am I here? Your, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm from J.P. Morgan and Bank Our Size. If we were to follow your prescription uh, round numbers here, we would have to raise three hundred and fifty billion dollars. Assuming you stay equity. in equity. Okay. So mm -hmm. yes. So so what I my first question I have two. My first question is, um, will you come back to New York with me and work on the press release sure. so that I book the meeting with my sure. chairman to say that he should issue sure. some three hundred fifty no, billion dollars. I want all of the banks to do to do this okay. over time. Yeah. So I predict that meeting will go and well. And they'll retain earnings. <laughs> so you shouldn't pay the dividends. That's what I, the first thing. <laughs> okay. I, I predict the meeting wouldn't go to, too well. Um, I'm not second, <laughs> second question. To, to, uh, wh why not go to 100%? I'm not sure I got that. I, Should we go all the way to 100%? I said I'm going to leave all these uh, deposits there. I'm leaving the function of banking. I just don't want, I want to back up. They have liabilities because liabilities is part of their business. So Apple doesn't have that as part of their business, but banks do. I want to back up their liabilities more than is backed up right by now. That, that's what I want. I think some of the backing, some of the liabilities are not essential to their, to their business. Long-term debt is not essential to banking business. Yeah, Nobody's going to tell me why they need long-term debt instead we're, of equity. We're not advocating 100% equity. Right. Clearly, clearly that's pushing in the direction of reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> what we're doing is we're starting right now and we're saying if, and it's really what David Miles said, and we're backing it up by just some clear-headed thinking about it in the sense of if we push equity more, and it may take you a little bit of time to get to 300 billion more in equity, we understand that, but if you, <laughs> if you push more equity more, what, well, one thing you can do is not said is not pay dividends <laughs> for a while, but if you, if you, if you uh, basically push more and have a bigger equity cushion, as Peter's explained, that's not gonna change your cost of funding. You may believe that, it's only going to change your cost of the funding to the extent that it takes away tax advantages, which we really should work to neutralize. And I realize a lot of us would like to just say, we can't fiddle with the tax code. The tax code is what it is. But that's, that's too easy. In other words, if we're really creating problems because we're unwilling to change the tax code, that's a real problem. Uh, so let's basically take away the subsidies, take away the tax code, push it in the direction of having self-insurance by people out there that should be self-insuring, you and me, not through the tax system, but through holding equity in banks, and go to a very comfortable point 
where we know that we've got enough to basically survive uh, the type of thing that we saw in 2007, 2008. Your bank did better than others, so maybe it's unfair that uh, you're coming under this, but we know that some other banks didn't, uh, didn't do that well, and we have to make, uh, make it safe for, for, for the entire sector. And as a first order effect, having a lot more equity, not going to 100%, but getting maybe 10 or 15 more percent is going to be a huge benefit and the costs are just private costs and we should figure out how to basically take those away so that the right decisions get made on, on an economic basis. Okay, thank you. We'll finish with just a few questions at the mic now. Don't add to the list because we'll just ask the point of Right. So Paul, I, I think it was in one of your slides, um, maybe it was one of Anna's, it, it talked about uh, kind of manipulation opportunities with Wilson's solution. And, and Wilson, when you were talking, I, I, I kept thinking and trying to think in my mind, what's the transition between debt holders and equity holders? Because you probably are going to have a transition, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think there's something that's important about both of these. There's friction in each one, right? There, there's also a lot of friction in what you're proposing, I, I think probably more. Could, could the two of you just comment on that friction concept? I think, I think our position is, is that we don't see what these frictions are in terms of true economic costs. Again, there, there's, there are private issues here that a lot of people in this room focus on, but remove those and think about what the true social costs are, and those aren't salient. I think our reservation about any system that requires some individual with some discretion in a position of uh, distress to pull some triggers, uh, that's, that's something that makes you wonder why you're having to do that. Why not just have that as equity in, in, in the first place? That in particular applies to the COCOs. So it may be good to have a lot of equity and then in addition have, 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 have bail-in. But again, uh, if, if you're having uh, liabilities out there that are gonna provide that bail-in, there's still the question, what are, they, what are they serving? Why can't they be equity? I think that's the question. And they're not cheaper. That's the point, they're not cheaper. There's the illusion of them being cheaper because you say, I'm only paying 6% on this and my equity is costing me 15, but we know that that's not gonna be correct. Yeah, yeah, what led me to the friction, just to clarify, is partly when you put up the thing about the REITs and then the 30%. Um, I, I happen to know a fair amount about that market and how it got the way it is, and it, it, you know, I think it's largely a function of the way analysts look at things. And I think analysts have a way of looking at things today, both you know, on the sell side and the buy side. And, and the, the business of making that, transaction, that transition is the friction, I think, that's associated with your kind of concept. Now, the friction in Wilson's is quite different. It's literally a movement in money between a class of owners that won't be able to continue holding something because their own capital requirements will go up. So you have to move the money over to a different set of buyers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to hear about how that would work. And particularly also, I didn't understand Wilson to have a notion of a trigger that had to be pulled. It just happens. Yes? Oh. No. Yeah. It does require uh, sure. We didn't get into this, but the exact issues of triggers. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in this. I think the easiest one for me is when a bank is either critically undercapitalized or critically illiquid. And that can be in a bail-in system late. It can be in Lehman Friday when they tell you we can't settle trades on Monday. That does not require a lot of discretion. That requires knowledge of a fact of deep illiquidity. Um, in a lot of the systems we use with the FDIC, we can move a little bit earlier than that. Um, so there are triggers that sometimes happen in advance of that. But it still should be a very late in the game debt-like uh, event. Okay. I but, exactly. but that happens already with respect to FDIC institutions. And I think the bond market has gotten comfortable saying this is what default or insolvency means for a bank. You could move that further back if you didn't have uh, FDIC funds at risk to something where you couldn't fund on Monday. To answer your more general question, at least as, as I see it, and I'm not, a, not an economist like uh, the three people up here, the transition from where we are to a bail-in system relies on the capital structure of banking as it largely exists today. Um, I think that makes things a lot simpler. Uh, I think the, there will be transitional costs, but I think they're much easier to manage. Some increase in debt cost, um, but I think that's a reasonable price worth paying to get too big to fail out. I think some of the costs proposed in this system would be 
potentially much larger. I, I know that uh, I want, you disagree I want, with me I want on you that. to tell me the cost of withholding equity payouts. Uh, nobody has been able to give me the cost well, of that. Well, I, I can give you one example. When, when we issued our COCOs, which, are, which have to turn into equity um, on either a capital trigger, a failure trigger, or a government assistance trigger. So in any one of the bad states of the world, they have to become equity. So they are not in okay. any way protected by the state. Issuing that debt raised the value of our equity by about 10% over the course of that next week relative to people saying, I thought Credit Suisse might have to retain all of this equity over the, near, of, over the next period. That this was something that the market seemed to value this, uh, this package of instruments better than just raw equity. Well, uh, your triggers, uh, we need, will need to discuss this later, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, there is, if the total risk is borne by the balance sheet, then we have fundamental insights that the risk cannot be held by somebody else, and therefore the overall cost cannot change. That's a physical reality of this. And this is like a so gravity force. Okay, just a second. In terms of triggers, in terms of triggers, uh, I think that one of the frictions is, uh, is captured by the statement that uh, was proved in a recent yeah. paper uh, by an author that actually was invited to be here today and couldn't, uh, that shows that uh, there is extremely, uh, there's a knife edge case where if you have a price trigger, price equity trigger, there even exists sort of a way, a rational way to price these Things because there could be situations where if you didn't have the trigger and the, and the conversion ratio just right, you know, there would either be a situation where if you assume that it converts, it doesn't, and if it's uh, there's sort of a multiple equilibrium or, two, or, one, or no equilibrium, all kinds of things like that. The trigger based on, on book values is not clearly going to prevent a crisis. And so we will debate from today to tomorrow about these triggers. Our point potentially, our point completely is that we have not been given a reason by Erwin or anybody that whatever he was going to issue as COCOs should not be equity. Just because you can actually sell something does not prove anything because you can sell any security out there. My question, my final question about COCOs is if they're so good, why don't firms just issue them? Firms in the rest of the economy. In other words, they're not illegal to issue. There are lots of things that can be issued. If they do something like get tax benefits and remove and reduce bankruptcy costs, why don't we see COCOs issued in the rest of the economy? Here they are issued because of capital, they, because the Swiss capital requirements allow half of the capital requirements to be satisfied this way. So they're 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 instead of equity, they're issued. But why aren't they issued? Why aren't they issued by the rest of the market? Well, the the rest of the market can use Chapter 11. Ex no, but why aren't Actually, they issued? Sorry, sorry Daryl, aren't you? Why aren't they issued? I understand that, so I understand why people do COCOs under regulation. But, I but understand to, why to people don't do COCOs who don't have to do what, anything. Low bankruptcy costs. Low, low bankruptcy costs. But even lower with COCOs. Why not COCOs? You get, why not COCOs instead of equity but, for, but for Apple? Having spent some time with leveraged finance people, you get very COCO-like effects with regular debt structures in industrial corporations. You don't get that for financials. So we have a lot of this automatic equitization in a normal industrial company. That doesn't happen naturally for banks. We, we need to do something different. Because they don't, the banks don't want to. But I'm saying that they will feel differently about it, both of, if regulators make them and if they're already highly capitalized. Anyway, we have to go. One Sorry. One. Sorry, one, oh, one, one, last, Sorry. One, la one last question. Um, so for, first, uh, first a comment. Um, it's it's interesting, I guess that there, I noticed sort of two themes in in the in the discussion. One is that the externalities of bank failure are huge, and so there's huge kind of imperfections in the asset market, which call, which are arise when bank fails, uh, banks fail. At the same time, you have Modigliani Miller that requires very very good capital markets and very wise investors to perfectly see through that the risk of, of their their holdings has fallen in a certain way. And so it's interesting to me you have you have both of those concepts going at the same time. Just a comment. Um, I guess my second question, my question is, is this. Why didn't the banking sector work better in the 1800s? Um, capital requirements were at 30%, or not requirements, but capital was 30%, 40%. It was in the UK, it was in the US. Um, people still made lots of bad decisions, right? There were still railroad bubbles, canal bubbles, uh, this, that, et cetera. 
uh, you had you know lots of, of economic history written on this period and, and the sort of bad and follies of banking. Why, why did that happen? Okay. Now, I'm actually not a historian of banks. I barely know anything about banks. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm asking my questions and I still didn't get any answers. So I'm, I know enough to ask these questions uh, from a year and a half of looking at it. Uh, but the history of, of, of bank, I don't pretend to know. But I can say the following. There, these banks were not publicly held. The access to equity could have been, they, had the, they didn't have diversification opportunities like banks today have. The world is different. The question is, why can't the world be the same on the total capitalization? That's the question. As for our bank right now, why not? So we can go back in history and ask these questions, and we can come up with all kinds of reasons that might or might not have to do with where we are right now. But what we're asking is right now, for the banking system that we have right now, and given the crisis that we had just recently, why can't we, what is the impediment for banks to stop paying dividends and equity payouts and raise some rights offerings and other things and capitalize themselves over the next five years, six years to levels that seem crazy, but maybe are not. When, when Anat said that she was going to be on the stage until someone took her off, I was thinking to myself, gosh, <laughs> is that going to be me? <laughs> Uh, actually, the last 10 minutes or so, even though we, we went over with them, I, um, I viewed as actually quite memorable and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Uh, I want to thank everybody, uh, the speakers, the participants, the Clearinghouse, Paul, uh, for a wonderful day. And uh, I learned a lot, and I hope we get to do this again. Thank you for coming.